friend and welcome to the WW Radio Show, your Walt Disney World Information Station. I'm your host, Lou Mangiello, and together as we have been for the past 17 plus years, we're going to celebrate the magic of the Disney parks, movies, Marvel, Star Wars, and more here on the podcast, my weekly live video on Facebook, events, blog, and more. Please be sure to subscribe to the podcast, join the community, and find everything else at www.radio.com. So join me this week as we look at 10 more secrets and stories you never knew about Walt Disney World, including a different kind of pirates, a lost Liberty Square dark ride, what almost came to Walt Disney World outside the parks, cheese, and more. And then stay tuned for our Disney trivia question of the week and more updates at the end of the show. And if you like what you hear, please share the show and tell a friend. So sit back, relax. And enjoy this week's episode of the WW Radio Show. We are all storytellers, and Disney is a storytelling company at its heart. From the retelling of classic fairy tales to new fantastical journeys into the unknown, we are fascinated by and fall in love with the stories that Disney tells on the screens and in the parks. But sometimes it's the locations themselves that are the subject of those stories because it's within the parks that some of the stories are actually born. But not all of those stories are known. And I think some of the most interesting, intriguing and fun ones are often lost to time and of various other factors. But those are some of the ones that I love sharing here on the show most, and I am not alone. In fact, Mr. Jim Corcus has been sharing some stories from the Disney people, parks, movies, and animation for years, dare I say decades. And this week, he's joining me, us, here at the virtual table to discuss 10 more secrets and stories you never knew about Walt Disney World and back again is my friend, prolific author, former cast member, and raconteur, Mr. Jim Corcus. Jim, buddy, it is good to see you again. Uh, thank you so much, my friend Lou. And and trust me, you will never, ever be alone. I, 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 you're certainly not alone uh, in life, and at, at any event that you go to, you are the furthest thing from alone that I that I can imagine. So, um, but it, it, it's always so much fun to uh, get together, even even if it's uh, uh, just over the phone for uh, uh, a podcast here. And uh, one of the exciting things about your podcast is I always feel I come away uh, smarter. I always feel I come away with a. Uh, uh, a new perspective, it, it, and oftentimes, you know, that new little bit of information that uh, uh, I never uh, uh, knew, you know, and, and, you know, Walt Disney World is just such a, a, a rich place for uh, uh, details and, and storytelling, and, and you can't, um, you can't grasp them all, you know, and, and especially these days, uh, Walt Disney World just seems to be that uh, uh, reservation vacation where you have to make a reservation for a, a particular day and a particular park and for a particular attraction and a particular place to eat and and all of that. So it, it, it takes away a lot of that um, just aimless uh, wandering 
where sometimes you stumble across something and you go, what is that? And, and why is that there? And, and, and I know you have that, uh, same fascination that, that I do that, you know, you, you, it's so seamless. It's so easy to just accept things, but, um, there's a reason oftentimes why things are there. There's a, there's a story behind things are there. It, it's not just, you know, uh, woke up one morning and, oh yeah, let's, let's put that lamppost right there. You know, uh, th- there's all of that. And so, you know, I'm very excited, uh, uh about that, uh, be- because, uh, a- as you know, I just released, uh, uh, the book Final Secret Stories of Walt Disney World, available on Amazon. And it's the fifth book that I wrote that contains um, uh, uh, two-page stories about uh, details of, of, of the parks and the resorts and outside of, uh, of the resorts and, and, and the history. So there, there's over 500 stories that I've documented as well as uh, another book called uh, uh, Extinct Secret Stories of uh, Walt Disney World, uh, listing, you know, many of the things that uh, we miss that that disappeared, you know, from the, uh, you know, like the lawnmower tree at at, at Fort Wilderness and, and all of that. And so it's finally gotten to the point where I'm pooped. <laughs> Things, things are just happening so quickly at Disney. Things are changing so much. Disney's middle name is changed that I can't keep up that I decided, look, I'm just going to write a final book to wrap up the first 50 years. And one of those people listening to, to lose podcasts will have to start writing books about <laughs> the next 50 years that, that are coming because uh, I'm just out of breath. <laughs> right, you're not out of stories. You're you're out of. Although you could be. I mean, I know you're not out of stories because when I said before about you being a prolific writer, and look, you are so generous with your time and your friendship. We talked about the first ten stories back on show six thirty seven. But you've been on so many over the years. We've talked about Wilderness Lodge and Old Key West mm-hmm. and the Disney Institute and the Boardwalk and Luna Park and some of what might have been and some of what is extinct, but I love this idea of, first of all, I I love the way, just as a very quick aside about the book, one of the things I love about the book is the way you've laid it out. I like the fact that they are short, easily consumable stories, so you can pick it up, grab a story, and then just move on. You don't have to worry about getting lost in these very long chapters, sort of these little bite-sized bits of Disney history and stories and facts, and that's why this week, we're going to share in a relatively bite-size-ish format, if you don't mind taking big bites, 10 more secrets and stories that you may <laughs> have never heard before from Walt Disney World. Jim, you are my guest. You are my friend. You are the author of the book. So I invite you to please go for First, we'll sort of go back and forth and, and share some stories and, and chat a little bit about them. And I'm very curious to hear where you go first and, and why you sort of put this one first on the list of the ones that you wanted to share. Okay, well, uh, it, this has always been a, a favorite of mine, and, and it's been one that uh, most guests uh, completely miss. It's Wilson's Cave Inn, I-N-N, you know, referring like to a, 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 a tavern uh, type of situation. And the only place you can see it is on the uh, riverboat on the rivers of America. I, I, I don't think it occurs to to most Disney fans that there's some things that you can only see uh, from the riverboat, you know, like uh, uh, good old uh, 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 Beacon Joe over there, who uh, I wrote about in, in previous volumes and is a huge favorite of mine because, uh, again, he appears in other Disney attractions. He's, he, he The same audio animatronic sculpt for Beacon Joe there sitting there with his dog and fishing is the one used for the uh, uh, king at the banquet table in in haunted uh, mansion and and one of the uh, pirates in the cell trying to mm-hmm. get the dog to give them uh, uh, the key so 
and and of course, Beacon Joe originally came from um, uh, Disneyland, where when you're taking the boats and on the right hand side you have Blue Bayou, on the left hand side you have um, uh, this uh, uh, shack, you know, in the bayou, and 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 this guy, you know, in in the chair, you know, playing his banjo. That that's uh, Beacon Joe, and and he was designed by. Uh, Mark Davis, and, and he ended up uh, on the rivers of America because uh, pirates was never supposed to come uh, to um, Walt Disney World. They, they were going to do Big Thunder Mesa with cowboys and Indians. But anyway, getting back to uh, Wilson Caven, Wilson Caven is, is actually based on something real. You know that's one of the reasons uh, I, I I love it. It, it it's based on cave in rock uh, that's still on the shores of the Ohio River in uh, southern uh, Illinois, and and basically what would happen is uh, river pirates and all would hide in the cave and then come out, you know, and and attack boats, uh, basically, you know, robbing victims, killing them, you know, and um, uh, it, it was there since the Revolutionary uh, uh, War, and uh, in the uh, uh, 1700s, a, a fellow by the name of Jim Wilson uh, took the whole thing over and opened a business there called Wilson's Liquor Vault and House of Entertainment. So river travelers would then stop there and go in, you know, for food and drink and gambling and uh, uh, let's just say overly friendly women, and as a result would get drunk and, and would get, you know, killed and uh, robbed and uh, all of that so the pirates didn't have to go out and, and, uh, and attack uh, uh, the, the boats, you know. And, and so on the riverboat at Walt Disney World, you know, you hear Sam tell the guests that uh, uh, Cutthroat Corner there is the most likely place to find the river pirates, and uh, uh, listening to the noises coming out of Wilson's cave, he says, you know, we should be safe for a while because their interests lie elsewhere, which means gambling and wild women. Now, the reason all this sounds so familiar and the reason it's there um, in a Disney park, uh, it, uh, first off, you can go on the History Channel, there's a, a, a documentary about this, and and if any of you saw the movie uh, How the West Was Won, mm -hmm. you know, Jimmy Stewart ended up in there. But in uh, 1955, in the television episode Davy Crockett and the River Pirates, it was um, Davy Crockett and Georgie Russell, you know, who uh, d uh, discovered the, the cave-in and, and that the uh, criminals in there were disguising themselves as, as Indians so that Indians, Native Americans, would get... Uh, blamed uh, as they were looting passing uh, 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 boats, and and so uh, uh, Davy and Georgie, you know, uh, went in there and uh, with uh, uh, several kegs of uh, uh, gunpowder, you know, uh, blew up the cave. But in real life, of course, the cave uh, 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 still exists uh, there, so uh, you can. Uh, see it not only at Walt Disney World, but you can see it at um, in in Ohio. And, you know, I, I'm just old school. I just love uh, uh, Davy Crockett, and, and there are just so many Davy Crockett references, you know, uh, uh, through, throughout the, the park. And, 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 and you know, you, you think, oh, well, yeah, well, uh, uh, Frontierland, Davy Crockett, Frontierland. No, go over to Fort Wilderness, and, and I think one of the, the hidden treasures over there is um, uh, Crockett's Tavern. Uh, you know, it, it, it opened in uh, uh, 1985 as an extension of uh, trails, the Trails End uh, uh, restaurant, which I also uh, uh, like. And... Um, you know, it has a full service bar and all that. But but the uh, uh, manager of resort uh, design at the time uh, was a huge uh, Disney Davy Crockett fan. 
So it's loaded up with Crockett Anna. You know, uh, 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 there's a, a small replica of the uh, Gully Wumper uh, uh, keelboat from the TV series, and um, uh, Davy's old Betsy rifle. And there's paintings of Fess Parker as Davy and Buddy Epson as as uh, Georgie. And there, there's this huge, imposing, terrifying stuffed grizzly bear. Uh, next to a glass uh, display uh, featuring uh, uh, a classic uh, 1843 portrait of the real Davy Crockett in a coonskin cap, a real coonskin cap, and letters and other items. And, and, and I'm sure your listeners know, and you know, why would they have a stuffed grizzly bear there? I mean, because why not? Why wouldn't you have a stuffed grizzly bear at the front of Crockett's Tavern? Killed him a bear when he was only three. That's the bear. So, so, some kind of fake Disney Davy Crockett fan you are for crying out loud. But, <laughs> but but if it's any consolation, it took it took me a couple of minutes too. Well, grizzly bear, yeah. Disney usually doesn't do you know stuffed you know animals and and and, and all of that. You know they. Uh, they used to when Disneyland opened. He's not stuffed. Really he's just don't... sleeping. The bear's just resting, kids. <laughs> <laughs> the bear's just taking a nap. Well, well you, you know, I, I, I guess the gag uh, uh, it could be made. What do you feed a, a, a grizzly bear? Uh, you don't feed him anything because he's stuffed uh, <laughs> from eating over there at uh, Trail's End. So there you go. Yeah, uh, your turn, buddy. Mm. Your 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 turn to come up with something. As a very quick aside, I love the fact that you put this in because this was one I actually thought of too, Jim. Putting in so great nerdy minds truly do think, think alike. Like, yeah, because one of the things or I or, love or, about... or or love uh, love certain things because it's like that's just so right. The, 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 that makes sense. That's why they did that. Wow, that's well, cool. I, I love this because, like so much in in Frontierland and in Liberty Square. It's based on a real place, right? It's based on mm-hmm. something that has a, a significant historical story to it, plus the, the, the Davy Crockett, you know, television program connection, uh, which, tell me if I, I, it's been a long time since I see it, but didn't the Davy Crockett version reference um, not Jim Wilson, but uh, Sam Mason, who took over yes, after, it's, 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 right. Sam Mason... Uh, it took over after uh, uh, Jim. You are sharp, buddy. You are sharp. Yes. But I love the fact, too, that, you know, we, we go by it and we hear these sort of sounds. If you pay attention, you're on the starboard side of the boat. You can hear some of those sounds coming out. But you don't really know the sort of deep, dark, somewhat nefarious history of what that sort of throwaway mm-hmm. almost detail is on that side and again you know we could look we can go into long detail and story about you know the entire history of what we used to be able to see that was a little bit not necessarily yeah. disneyfied on the right hand side of the boat on the, the liberty square riverboat but but i love the fact that that you put this one in there um well and and and, 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 and again this is another example of how when imagineers are really really yeah. good they can put something in and if you don't know what it is, it doesn't impact your experience at all. But if you do, it just enhances it. It gives it yeah. just that little plus, that little Disney plus. It gives it that little extra yeah. Disney plus. <laughs> but to your point, everything speaks. There's a reason why everything's mm-hmm. there. There's a story. And if you want to peel back those layers, those stories are there. And it's, it's why I love doing these shows. It's why I appreciate the, the books mm-hmm. and stuff that you do. So I'm going to, you know, I'm going to stay in the same general vicinity because when I was researching my Liberty Square audio tour and my Frontier audio tours, I loved mm-hmm. the stories that the lands themselves had to share, both real history and imagineer legends. And with Halloween mm-hmm. coming up, I think it's also a great way to tie in my love of The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, right? That short Mm. story by Washington Irving published in the early 1800s. We know about Ichabod Crane, the school teacher, the headless horseman, Sleepy Hollow Cemetery, etc. 
Disney's connection to this by way of just quick history was they retold this in, if you haven't seen the the package film, The Adventures of Ichabod and Mr. Toad from 49, you have to, Mm -hmm. especially during this time of year. And it really made for a natural fit to incorporate this into Liberty Square because of the time and the place in which the story took place. The story that you might not know is that when designs and and plans for Liberty Square were coming together uh, in the late 60s, early 70s, even as late as probably early 1970, there was actually a concept for a dark ride based on the legend of Sleepy Hollow that was proposed by one Mr. Tony Baxter. And that was going to help sort of tell that. And if you listen to the audio tours, they talk about how really the I think the best way to come into fantasy into Liberty Square is from fantasy land because that story sort of crossing the Atlantic and moving forward in time really sort of helps sort of pull those two lands together. And this would have actually helped sort of be that connective tissue. And you would have ridden in not a doom buggy, but this jack-o'-lantern through a number of different scenes from the story and then obviously at the end you come face to face or face to pumpkin with the headless horseman (laughs) it was obviously it was meant to be more of a humorous attraction right so before they decided to do things like mr toad's wild ride this was going to be one of the more light-hearted humorous attractions and where it would have been is where memento mori yankee trader shop is Mm -hmm today um and it's not you know what i love too jim is it's not the only time and again i really do love the story not just the the one from the adventures of ichabod and mr toad but i love the 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 legend of sleepy hollow itself and it's not the only time that the legend was planned for either walt disney world or even disneyland we know of the concepts for the haunted mansion in walt disney world and the Museum of the Weird, and maybe they were going to, that was, that this Ichabod Crane encounter was with the Headless Horseman was going to be incorporated into that. We know what we ended up getting, which in, is obviously a much smaller and scaled back reference to the Legend of Sleepy Hollow with Sleepy Hollow refreshments, and then the voice and music lessons by Ichabod Crane over in the Yield Christmas Shop. But even in Disneyland, like Ken Anderson had submitted a concept for this finale encounter with the Headless Horseman. And we have other references in places like Mickey's Not-So-Scary Halloween Party with the Headless Horseman sort of kicking it off. Um, If you've ever done at Fort Wilderness, and I don't think they do this anymore, the Haunted Hayride, which um, I think they discontinued. Gosh, maybe it was... 10 years ago or so, which was one of the coolest Mm. special add-on ticketed events you could do. Very quick story. Like, it probably was 11 or so years ago. I was able to book it for my family on Halloween night. I love Halloween. I I was so... It was a surprise for them. My kids were very young. Don't make me cry on the podcast. So here I was, (laughs) like, super dad of the year. Like, oh, my God. We're going to live through the story of the Headless Horseman. My kids were petrified. I'm hysterically (laughs) laughing. But (laughs) to sort of wrap it up in in a bow, this idea of the legend of Sleepy Hollow, while we have elements of it in Walt Disney World now, at one point, we really almost had an entire dark ride based on the legend of Sleepy Hollow, and and I wonder what that concept art and what that final attraction might have looked like. Excellent choice, Lou. I, I, I'm a huge fan of uh, uh, the story of the legend of Sleepy Hollow myself, and uh, when I was working for the uh, Walt Disney uh, World Travel Company uh, uh, briefly, I, I actually got sent. Uh, to the Hudson River uh, Valley and, and got to, and it, it really looks like it's just from the book and it's so spooky and you, you, you don't know what uh, is there. And, and, and as you pointed out, there's suggestions of uh, the story all throughout, um, uh, you know, Liberty Square, you know, the food and beverage uh, 
uh, location at, at the entrance there is actually based on uh, the uh, two-room cottage um, uh, that uh, writer Washington Irving uh, purchased along the banks of the uh, Hudson River in Tarryton. In fact, it's a museum uh, uh, today. Uh, you know, after lots of uh, remodeling, and and I'm old enough to remember when you could go to that food and beverage location, and sometimes uh, they would have an item like a uh, a plastic mug that that you could buy that would have the uh, headless uh, horseman, uh, mm. you know, on on uh, one side. It, it it was it was designed like a. A, a a a stein, you know, rather than just a, a, a cup, and, and and again, that's just that all that attention to to detail uh, that Disney does, and and yes, I remember the haunted uh, hayride uh, uh, as well, and uh, I think it, yeah, I think you're right. I think it uh, discontinued around uh, uh, 2010, 2011. Uh, somewhere uh, uh, around that, and and again uh, to this day, you know, you still have um, uh, the headless horseman leading off uh, uh, the Halloween parade for Mickey's uh, not so scary. And, and to me, the scariest thing is that according to Disney, Halloween starts in August. <laughs> but <laughs> I'm way behind in eating my Halloween candy. For Disney, but, Halloween but, but starts it, when the weather gets down to a nice, cool, fall-like 97 degrees outside. So. <laughs> Will that ever happen uh, again? <laughs> uh, so anyway, uh, and, and as long as you brought that up, let's let's stick around Liberty Square. That, that, that That's good because uh, there's something that I just, really love in in liberty square and um uh, it's sort of a a, a hidden treasure it, it, it's a place that i always like to uh go grab a, a quick bite to eat and there always seems to be room and that that's the columbia harbor house mm. and uh you know theme to you know a, a colonial uh, uh new england uh, tavern and and i can tell you that the uh 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 uh, proprietor of the Harbor House is uh, Harold Stallmaster, and the innkeeper is a woman by the name of Priscilla Lapham. And, and I can say that with a hundred percent surety, as uh, any uh, sharp-eyed uh, Disney fan could, because uh, around uh, 2011, crates were added to Liberty Square, and they were addressed to different residents of the locale. You know, yeah, you and I always talk about, you know, you should look up, you should look down, you should look around, you know, because you never know what's going to be there. And so there's a, a crate uh, addressed uh, to the proprietor of the Harbor House, and that's Harold Stollmaster. Now, Harold Stollmaster happened to be the actor who portrayed the role of Johnny Tremaine hmm. in the 1957 uh, 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 Disney film. And there's another crate addressed to innkeeper Priscilla Lapham. And that was the name of the character who was Johnny's love interest in the story. And, and I agree with you, uh, a, a great entrance into Liberty Square is, is through Fantasyland. And, and in fact, Columbia Harbor House has two entrances. But the two entrances are different. You know, because it's located between Fantasyland and Liberty Square. And so um, the Fantasyland side actually represents a uh, a dock uh, in England, you know, uh, uh, because, again, it's just right below Peter Pan's uh, uh, flight attraction there. And this would have been the dock area where you would have boarded, you know, uh, uh, the uh, uh, ship you know, to, to go to the New World. But at that time, uh, people were generally illiterate. So if you look up at the hanging sign, it features a chicken and a fish. And that's to indicate what was served inside the restaurant because people couldn't read, you know. And, um, you know, just like English pubs uh, at the time sometimes had images on them to, uh, to identify themselves. But on the Liberty Side Square... 
it represents a port in New England. And so it's later, you know, in, in history. And the sign spells out the name Harbor uh, with a U in it. And instead of images of chicken and fish, there's an image of an American eagle. And, and that doesn't mean they serve American eagle uh, uh, in there. What it is, is it means that this represents that time of the, you know, American Revolution, because the eagle was uh, first designed um, as a symbol uh, in uh, uh, around 1775, 1776. And, and if you look closely at the eagle, and I always love to do this when I have friends there, you know, j just to show off, you know, there, there's no sense in, in, in knowing all of this stuff, you know, if you can't sometimes, you know, just show off and go, oh, pshaw, you know, oh, you know, I'm not really, you know, that knowledgeable. Uh, so uh, those of you who are listening, you can do this. Um, if you look at the eagle, the 13 arrows representing the original 13 colonies are in the right claw, and that signifies war. But if you take a look at a, a dollar bill and you look at the back of the dollar bill, there, there's, again, the same image of the eagle, but the arrows are in the left claw and the olive branch is in the right one. So that signifies peace. Now, uh, something that uh, a lot of people probably don't realize is that the concept sketches for Columbia Harbor House were done by Imagineer Dorothea Redmond, you know, and I, I'm sure uh, some of your listeners uh, recognize uh, her name. You know, she did a lot of design work at Walt Disney World, you know, including the uh, the mural in the breezeway of, of Cinderella Castle there and, and a lot of stuff at, at Disneyland. Uh, and Harbor House didn't open until um, summer of 72. So that that's almost a, a year after the park opened. And, and along with the Harbor House, uh, Old World Antiques, the perfume shop, uh, Heritage House, all of that open. Now, in the original concepts, it, it was uh, called the Nantucket Harbor House, mm -hmm. and and sometimes in in, in some of the early uh, uh, blueprints, it was New Bedford, and sometimes it was Montauk Point. Now, it became Columbia Harbor House because they had plans for the sailing ship Columbia to ply the waters of the River of America just like they, they do at uh, Disneyland. And, and again, one of the reasons that didn't happen was, that, again, it all comes down to money and, you know, trying to get the park open by October 1st, uh, uh, 1971, you know, they, they had to make, you know, some cuts and they never got back to replacing some of those because, again, there was an oil crisis in uh, uh, 1973 and oil prices shot up. So, you know, travel was... Cur can you imagine that? Can you imagine that? That oil prices shot up so high that people couldn't afford to travel. And fortunately, we learned from that in 1973, so it will never happen again. Anyway, um, uh, one of the reasons for incorporating the Columbia was uh, because in uh, 1787, that he, it became the first American sailing ship to circumnavigate the globe. And 1787 was also when the Constitution was ratified, and that's also um, uh, the number that is on the building that uh, houses uh, uh, the Hall of Presidents. And uh, uh, one of the things I love about Columbia Harbor House is, it, even though it's one of the largest restaurants of the Magic Kingdom, it, it's divided into these small dining areas, you know, named after uh, port towns in New England, like Charleston and uh, Cape Hatteras and Cape Cod and uh, Portsmouth and Salem and, and, and all of that. And then on the second floor, uh, there's a, a room dedicated to the, the Haunted Mansion. So it has paintings of the ghost ship like the Flying Dutchman. And um, there's a map from the National Geographic uh, that is framed. It marks the locations of uh, 500 ships that were lost on the U.S. coastline between Virginia and and North Carolina. There, there's all sorts of things, including a recreation of a painting from 20,000 Leagues Under the Sea. But here's something I didn't know until uh, recently. You, you, you know, um, uh, we look at the Haunted Mansion across the way there, and we go, 
Oh, yes. Well, it's on the uh, Hudson River, right? Da, 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 da. And no, it's not. Not really. Because if you take a look at that left side of the queue as you're, you're going up to the Haunted Mansion, that is a seawall. And a seawall would have been built near an ocean. And the ocean is where the Columbia sailing ship would have sailed. Hmm. So that's why that wall is there. Is it, It's a seawall. Uh, you know, uh, meant to, per, you know, stop uh, the, the waves from the sea, you know, pounding into your into your house and onto, onto the, the land there. So um, that's uh, that's a little uh, bit of new information for, for some of you. And uh, again, um, Liberty Square only exists at Walt Disney World. And this, kids, is why we have Jim Corcus on the show. <laughs> I love it. I love it. Um, and, you know, I, I, it's, it's interesting because I, I think we're, we're also very similar. We love talking about the things that never came to be. And, and I wonder all the time, <laughs> like, just how different the parks would have been not just if some of these concepts have come to pass, but like what if Walt had been alive to take it through construction and mm. not just inside the park, but throughout property. So, for example, we've talked about on the show in the past multiple times, and we know of the, the concepts for the Asian, the Persian, and the Venetian resorts, which obviously mm-hmm. were unbuilt. But did you also know all of you collectively, that original plans for Walt Disney World included things like, including but not limited to, an ice rink, a Mm. swamp ride, a roller dome near the monorail station, near where the ice rink would be, and an international airport with multiple runways, not the little stall port, but an international (laughs) airport where Celebration sort of currently sits, right? So in terms of the airport... Between MCO, which was not an international airport, becoming the Orlando International Airport, it didn't necessarily need that on property. And then as plans for Epcot, the city became abandoned, that idea was as well. And one that I've always had a, I've always fascinated by, I haven't really seen or heard a lot about, was another concept which seems incredibly cool way out of place but there was also rumor of an attraction that was dreamed up by claude Coates, legendary imagineer Mm -hmm. that would have been located between tomorrowland and Mm. the contemporary utilizing the waters of bay lake based on not tron but dinosaurs And Mm. according to Tony Baxter, Claude loved dinosaurs. He helped design the ones for the World's Fair. And he wanted to have this water ride through prehistoric times and life-size dinosaurs in this area in between Tomorrowland and and, uh, uh, and the contemporary. I'm sure you have heard this story. You probably know way more about it and maybe have seen some of the concept art that I have never been able to find. But the idea of a dinosaur attraction and an ice rink and a roller dome and all these things, how different that sort of 30,000 foot view landscape of what Walt Disney World could have been is always fascinating to me. You know, and, and you're, you're absolutely right. And, and so, so Disney should probably be uh, uh, suing uh, Universal Studios uh, uh, Florida for the Jurassic Park ride, right, for... <laughs> Uh, uh, infringing on copyright there, but but yes, there was supposed to be a dinosaur ride. Uh, not only because uh, uh, Claude loved dinosaurs, and who doesn't, you know, but it would also help connect the contemporary with uh, uh, Tomorrowland, you know, to to make that connection. You could get on the ride at one point, and you could get off the ride, you know, at at the other. And I know that some listeners are going, that doesn't make any sense. The Tomorrowland is the future, and 
and the contemporary, you know, is the future. That's why that that's why you could see it from Tomorrowland. And I say you've got to know your history, because at Disneyland, when you leave the train station in Tomorrowland, what do you experience? Right, we experience you see through the tunnel. Primeval world, yeah. Yeah, and, and so that's, that's why it made sense to them. Oh, yeah, dinosaurs at the end of Tomorrowland, of course. <laughs> that makes sense. You know, and when Walt incorporated Primeval World into um, uh, uh, Disneyland, even John Hench said, this, make, this makes no sense. And, and, and Walt replied, John, you don't understand storytelling. You know, this is a grand circle tour of the park. You need a grand finale. And so that's why Primeval World was there. Now, logistically, it's because that's the only place it can fit. <laughs> but, <laughs> but, you know, the Grand Canyon diorama and then Primeval, that's the only place logistically it could fit. But for in Walt's mind, it was like, I'm telling a story. You know, and and the story needs a finale. And and again, Disneyland didn't used to have all of those uh, train stations. You, you know, when when it first opened, you you basically got on at at Main Street, and it took you around the entire park because it was supposed to introduce you to the park of what was there and all of that because nobody had ever done anything like this before. And um, speaking of things that you know. Uh, just never existed. Uh, I was blown away years ago when when I had um, uh, a, a dinner with uh, uh, Tom Nabby. Tom, uh, Tom Nabby, of course, the original uh, Tom Sawyer over there at, at, uh, at Disneyland, but but later, you know, came over to Walt Disney World and was originally in charge of the uh, uh, monorails and. Uh, then so many other different things, a, a Disney legend and, you know, still full of energy and, 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 and all of that. And, and so I wanted to talk to him because I had always heard that, you know, uh, the monorails were supposed to be extended. And one of the extensions, uh, was supposed to be, uh, towards, uh, the Lake Buena Vista shopping village, which is, now called Disney Springs, and, and that they had even gone so far as uh, to lay some uh, uh, preliminary work for uh, setting foundations for pylons, you know, because uh, Florida has an aquifer, so you really have to make sure that that monorail track is, is secure so that there's no sinkholes and it, it's not going to happen. And so I wanted to talk about those concepts because he was there when that was doing and and he said yes, and and the monorail was supposed to go, and it the uh, uh, the station would have been where um, Team Disney is mm-hmm. today. Now now Tim Team Disney is, is that thing that looks like that nuclear power plant with that huge <laughs> uh, uh, sundial there, and and he said uh, yeah, and and then that's where people would grab hold of the people mover, and I said, what are you talking about, Tom? And, 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 and he said, yeah, the, the monorail would get there, but in order to get you, you know, to the, uh, uh, to the shopping village, there would be a people mover that would take you there and then it would go, uh, you know, all the way up, uh, hotel Plaza Boulevard, r- right up to, right up to crossroads. And, and, and I don't think people realize that when crossroads opened and for many, many years, crossroads was owned by disney mm-hmm. you know disney didn't announce it but it, it did I, I i i had a friend who came out and did not want to ever be off of disney property and, and i suggested crossroads because you know they had some great places to eat and it was less expensive and he would not set foot on the property so i had to prove to him that disney owned that property anyway um there was going to be a people mover and um uh, uh, Tom was in a, in a meeting where there were uh, concerns about how do you justify, you know, doing a people mover that that operates twenty four seven, 
uh, you know, on, on the off hours, you know, when there would be little usage. And so Tom suggested that they redesign the cars so they were more modular and then they could be used to deliver a, a product. So, so, you know, you could deliver product to the hotels along the way and up at Crossroads, you could pick up stuff and then, you know, uh, bring it back down. And uh, I later talked with Imagineer uh, Tom K. Morris, and, and he said, oh, yeah, he said that whole people mover plan uh, was part of, uh, uh, in the 70s, we were developing something called satellite communities. You know, Epcot was supposed to be the real community, the center community, and then there would be satellite communities uh, springing off from that, and and the um, uh, transportation to get there uh, would be this uh, uh, people mover, you know, and uh, uh, Wing Chow was involved, you know, uh, in this, and uh, all of that, you know, and, and they were going to expand the, expand the shopping village to, uh, more than 300 percent its initial size. And, and people don't realize that when um, what is now Disney Springs originally opened, it was so remote, uh, people didn't want to get there. Uh, and so in the ticket book sold at the Magic Kingdom, uh, there was a ticket good for a complimentary round-trip bus transport to the village and back so that uh, they would encourage guests to go visit it and and uh, uh, see where that was. So so roughly where uh, Team Bi- D- Disney building is today would have been a transportation hub mm-hmm. uh, for the monorail and extension of the monorail from there elsewhere and extension of the people mover uh, elsewhere uh, as when. well. But uh, what happens, all of this, and this was really a for serious discussion until about until about 1982 when Epcot opened, and and what happened again? We're talking money, you know. Epcot again was bleeding money, was was you know going over budget and all that. So there were certain things that had to get cut, and so this proposal was cut. They never cut. They said, "Well, we're putting this on hiatus. We'll come back and revisit this," but they never do. They never come back and revisit Thunder Mesa. They never come back and revisit any of these uh, <laughs> other things. But, um, you know, we could have had uh, a, a people mover, and we wouldn't have had to, to depend on uh, Mears buses or uh, minivans. So, yep, qu- quite a different world. Listen, any opportunity for more people mover in my life would be a, a good thing um, because it's... <laughs> Remains one of my favorite attractions in in, in Walt Disney World, um, and 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 that, and that was just Walt's place saver name. Yeah. You know, he he often comes up with just a place. He says, "We'll have this people mover do this," assuming they would come up with a fancier name, and they never did. They just kept <laughs> Walt. So you know, all this this conversation about things like the uh, the airport, and even this with with the monorail. Gets me thinking about again some other things that that happened and changed. And Jim, I I hope you're sitting down. You too, my friend, who's listening, because you might not know this, but the entrance to Epcot is in the wrong spot. <gasps> the entrance to Epcot is not where it's supposed to be. Let's go back to what we were just talking about. Walt's idea for this airport again which was supposed to be not just a place for people to come in and out of of walt disney world like this was supposed to be by the early 90s like this huge airport with thousands of workers and hotels and motels you know for people coming to the epcot the city area and across from this airport is where the entrance to epcot or the main gate was supposed to be and now if you, mm. if you are a Disney World aficionado, if you are a cast member, you know the words main gate very well because main gate now are these buildings that host different entities within the, the Walt Disney Company, the Disney Design Group, mm-hmm. uh, merchandise, I think entertainment is still uh, Entertainment there. has, yeah, and they do auditions there, yeah. Right, right. So there are these non-Disney looking sort of industrial almost buildings and offices that are there on an area by Sherberth Road, and that's known as 
main gate. That is the main gate area. And mm. Sherbeth Road, uh, you might see signs for it if and when you head on down to Disney's Animal Kingdom. It sort of connects that area over by 192. But Walt wanted every guest to enter the exact same place in the exact same way. Again, having, I think, learned from not the mistakes, but sort of the effects of Disneyland being surrounded on all sides by so many non-Disney-like or Disney-owned buildings, he Mm -hmm. wanted to not only control the entire experience in terms of what you see, but even just the way that you arrived. So at this main gate would be a welcome center that would have cast members there like Epcot, who would have the ability to speak multiple language to to welcome guests from wherever they were coming from in this, you know, entrance complex. Uh, But again, once things like MCO, which stands for McCoy Air Force Base, which used to be there, (laughs) opened in 1976 and obviously other plans change, this never happened. But if you sort of look down at a map, you can imagine the entrance to Epcot, so to Walt Epcot, being by Main Gate. Wow. <laughs> you know, it, 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 that, that's so cool. And, and, and again, uh, that was the spot of land. After Walt passed away, that was the spot of land that Cardwalker and Don Tatum tried to convince uh, Roy O. Disney that is where you should build the Magic Kingdom because the infrastructure is already, you know, in, in place. So it would save so much money. And Roy Disney said, absolutely not. He said, we're, we're going to build it where Walt wanted it built, which was on the, the north part of the property, on the worst piece of land <laughs> on the property they purchased. That's where they're building the Magic Kingdom because Walt felt that everybody would want to go to the entertainment venue so if you put it up there at, at the North Point and the only entrance was at the South Point, people would have to go through Epcot in order to get to the Magic Kingdom. And then they would also have to go through Epcot after they left the Magic Kingdom. So they would be you know, exposed to that. And something that is little known and not written about in the Disney-approved agenda narrative there is that at one point, uh, Card and Don had private discussions about trying to declare Roy mentally incompetent because he was wasting money. Mm-hmm. That never happened, but just the fact that they even had that discussion it is uh, very worrisome uh, there. Yeah. Well, I, I know the time is short, so let, let's do it. Uh, a little, light, uh, a, a little uh, lightning round through the last couple of ones. How's that? Right. Well, I've only got two more left, so uh, let's do a quick one. Let's go to a resort. Let's go to the Riviera Resort. You know, and and there's some there's some Disney Walt Disney World resorts that are extremely immersive. You know, like Wilderness Lodge that just you know is overwhelming and takes your breath away. And and then there are some resorts that are just I would say lightly uh, uh, themed. And and I think. Uh, uh, the Riviera uh, is uh, uh, one of them, you, you know, and, and it is supposedly based uh, on a, um, a, a European trip that Walt Disney and his brother Roy and their wives took in uh, 1935 that took them through England and France and Germany and Italy. And so uh, as, as a result, they, they uh, spent some time on, on, on the Riviera there. But, but again, I, I don't think the resort is completely themed to that uh, trip. It, it's more sort of a, a, a light uh, European Disney type theme, you know, like including foreign movie posters of Disney animated films on the wall. But, but one of the hidden treasures that I want to uh, do before we move on to something else is the Voyager's Lounge. You know, and, and it's done up like a, a, a library. And there, there's all these books on the shelves. And people, I don't think guests get the story. On this 1935 trip, Walt brought back with him hundreds of books, uh, uh, children's books with illustrations of uh, little people and bees and small insects and that he hoped would, you know, help in, in, inspire 
you know, the artists at, at his uh, Burbank uh, studio, you know, it, they were all in foreign languages, but, you know, you could look at the illustrations there. And when I say some books, 700 books. <laughs> and that was the beginning of the Disney Studio Library that began that same year he came back from the trip under the supervision of uh, uh, Helen uh, uh, Hennessy. And so in this Voyager's Lounge, these shelves are filled mm -hmm. with books. But if you look at them closely, they're all foreign editions from the 1930s, including several Disney storybooks that were printed overseas. And there's a display case that features an original Charlotte Clark doll, um, uh, a Mickey Mouse doll, and, and it's similar to the one that... Uh, uh, of photos of Walt and Lillian uh, on on uh, on the trip. You, you you've seen pictures of Walt carrying it, you know, on the mm -hmm. uh, on the on the ship, you know, be, because again, ships only way to, to get to Europe in, in those days. And and again, in those days, you didn't have a costumed Mickey Mouse, so Walt used, you know, uh, usually a, a, a Charlotte Clark doll, sometimes of varying sizes. Uh, there's also a fedora hat that looks very, very similar uh, to one in a photo next to it that uh, uh, Walt uh, wore, you know, uh, on his uh, on his trip. And and again, one of the things that I love and it and it breaks my heart when I see people just walk by so quickly and don't look is just outside that that lounge are all these black and white pictures uh, from. Uh, that 35 trip uh, on 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 the wall, including uh, there's one with Walt at the uh, London Zoo from June 1935, mm -hmm. and he's playing with uh, with penguins, you know. And it's like, oh my gosh! And it, it, just like I love the uh, uh, the the photos down in uh, Primo uh, uh, Piatto, you know, the quick service uh, venue on the first floor. So anyway, I I just want to tell folks. Next time you go visit Riviera, make sure you spend some time in the Voyager's Lounge and don't be as stupid as I am to try and pull a book <laughs> from the shelf. They're all glued together. I guess they figured there'd be a Jim Corcus who was figuring, well, nobody would miss this for an edition of Three Little Pigs here. Let me, oh, you know, no, Jim, it's just set decoration. Uh, all right. Very. I have just two left, and, and I'll go through these very quickly. Um, again, I'm going to go back to this idea of things that were never built. I, I, I love this, and I love looking at old maps. And some of the maps maybe are not super old and still had some intriguing concepts that we've just sort of forgotten about. So as long as we're talking about things we, that we never saw built and likely never will, let's talk about cheese. Hmm. The cheese attraction. I don't mean cheese the food, which would be awesome as long as it was indoors and air conditioned, but I mean cheese the character attraction. Cheese, and you're probably going, who or what is cheese? Cheese was a character from the Disney Fairies franchise that first debuted in the 2008 film Tinkerbell. Tinker, sorry, mm. Tinkerbell. He was one right. of these mice in Pixie Hollow that were sort of helpers of all of the different fairies. He was in Tinkerbell and the Lost Treasure, Tinkerbell and the Great Fairy Rescue. Jim, I know you have these all on 4K. And maybe, we don't know if his name was actually <laughs> Cheese, but, you know, they said... I, I have the extended uh, edition. <laughs> the director's with the, cut. <laughs> the, the two-disc uh, set with the director commentary. Yes, go yeah, ahead. Yeah, they said, well, Cheese has to be his name because he always comes when we say Cheese. And Cheese, the character, I guess was intended to be huge and planned for New Fantasyland. If you remember, when Disney first announced plans for New Fantasyland as part of that large expansion of Magic Kingdom, Pixie Hollow was part of that original, not very descript, <clears throat> excuse me, map and plan. <clears throat> there was a second iteration of that map, again, not necessarily what we ended up getting today, but that second iteration of the new Fantasyland model had a very different Pixie Hollow area than what we saw on the original concept art. The area itself had moved a little bit, 
but the attractions were different as well. One thing that was going to be part of this was going to be a huge meet and greet area. And the speculation was this was going to be something very different than anything we had seen before. This was going to be a much more high tech character interaction, living character technology experience where fairies would be projected in there and they'd be interacting with guests and things like that. But part of this area was going to be this cheese, almost like a um, a, a Luigi's attraction from Disneyland meets mm-hmm. uh, the Mad Tea Party meets Dumbo the Flying <laughs> Elephant um, in this outdoor uncovered area, obviously as plans for the new, new, new fantasy land took shape, the entire Pixie Hollow area uh, was abandoned, but we almost had an attraction built on cheese. <laughs> and, and, and again, when the, um, the plans for Pixie Hollow in fantasy land uh, fell apart, they, they discussed building a Pixie Hollow uh, for the Flower and Garden Festival at mm-hmm. Epcot. It would have been in that area between, uh, that little walkway area between uh, uh, Journey to Imagination to the entrance of uh, uh, World Showcase uh, Plaza, you know, where they, they had done other uh, little things. Like at one time, I, I, I think there was an Oz uh, uh, thing that was uh, uh, done there. So, And then they talked about moving Pixie Hollow and building it at uh, the studios because of the Tinkerbell mm-hmm. uh, film franchise, you know, and you could uh, put that there. And, and again, I have an entire chapter uh, about uh, the fairy franchise and Pixie Hollow in my uh, newest book, Off to Neverland, 70 Years of Disney's Peter Pan. And I, I love the original uh, uh, film that came out in uh, 1953, so uh, 2023. It's going to be its uh, uh, 70th uh, anniversary. And uh, nobody really writes about it. It, it. It's sort of like one of those orphan films uh, mm-hmm. after uh, uh, World War II that a lot of people just, you know, oh, yeah, I like that. And then just move on. And I, and it didn't look like Disney was going to write a book. And so, um, I actually started writing this book in 1992 (laughs) and, uh, the publisher, uh, let's say was not a man of integrity. And he took the manuscript and my illustrations and those of other authors and and sort of uh, disappeared uh, into the mist. And uh, I, I kept working on it and working on it and working on it. And so I uh, finally put it together, and I figured I want to cover as much of Peter Pan as I can and not just the film. So I, I cover Walt Disney uh, performing as Peter Pan in his elementary school play, in his own words, uh, 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 Walt, uh, the uh, silent movie version of Peter Pan that, that Walt bought. Uh, I, I found essays, two essays by Walt Disney talking about uh, Peter Pan and why he, he made it. And uh, then there are separate chapters on Captain Hook and Tinkerbell. And, and there's a whole Margaret Carey uh, interview and uh, Peter Pan in comics and Tinkerbell peanut butter commercials and and Peter Pan in the parks, including uh, uh, Disneyland's first flying Tinkerbells and uh, Peter Pan on Ice and and movies like Peter Pan Return to Neverland and I even have a chapter about Peter Pan and Wendy that live action film uh, with a diverse set of Lost Boys uh, that will be coming out on Disney Plus uh, later this year. So this is as up to date as as you can get it, and so uh, uh, off to Neverland. Seventy years of Disney's Peter Pan uh, is uh, uh, available at uh, Amazon.com right right now, and uh, the uh, forward is by Margaret Carey, and uh, the afterward is by June Foray. And you're going to say June Foray, the voice artist, but she's passed away. 
Yes, she did. And, uh, but she was the voice of one of the mermaids, and she was uh, the voice of the Indian squaw. But she saw my original manuscript and wrote a foreword for the book. And then when I later ran into her at uh, uh, the Disney Institute, when I was working as an animation instructor, there was an animation celebration. And, the, you know, you would bring in guests, and June Foray was brought in because she was doing... Uh, the voice of the grandmother in in uh, uh, Mulan, and uh, the first thing June said to me, "Where's the book? Did you find another publisher?" And so it's taken nearly three decades, but it, it's finally finished and uh, uh, should be uh, something worthwhile for you. And and those of you who are in the Central Florida area, Give Kids the World is doing a uh, fundraiser in October at uh, Give Kids the World uh, through the local uh, Disneyana uh, fan club. Um, and uh, they're going to have Margaret Carey there. They're going to have a guy who actually made a short Peter Pan featurette. Uh, and and uh, he and the animators will be there. And uh, the moderator for all of this will be yours truly, Jim Corcus. So, uh, those of you who are in the Central Florida area, there are still tickets available. Uh, so I'm, I'm sure Lou will uh, post the information on his site. And uh, gosh, this has just been exciting to uh, go over all of those Walt Disney World uh, stories from the uh, uh, final secret stories of Walt Disney World, which is also available out there. And for those of you who are Disneyland fans, uh, and who are going to be like Lou and attending uh, D23 out there in Anaheim while I'm suffering in the Florida heat and humidity. Uh, uh, another book that, I, that came out this year was Disneyland Historical Highlights, the Walt and Roy years, where I cover each individual year of Disneyland uh, from 1954 to 1972. So each chapter is just about that year. So there are there are facts, there are anecdotes, there are little uh, uh, essays. Um, so uh, you might want to think about those, especially with the uh, holidays coming up. Uh, you might want to ask uh, Santa to put those in your uh, uh, stocking as a stocking stuffer, or, or maybe get uh, uh, one or two for uh, your friends uh, as a uh, as a holiday gift and. Uh, Lou, I wish you safe travels uh, to Anaheim. I'm, I'm tremendously uh, envious, and uh, I, I'm also excited about all those people in California who have never seen Lou Mangello in person and now are going to get that chance. <laughs> I'm not sure that anybody's going out there hoping for that. But, Jim, this is always so much fun. There are, listen, we're going to have to do it again because there's way more secrets and stories we have to tell. I didn't Absolutely. even get to the fact that Epcot is sinking. I Sort of. Uh, mm. We'll save that for another day and won't we'll just, we'll sort of just leave that little tease out there. I want to know, and I think Jim does too. From you, our friend who's been sitting around this virtual table with us, what is your favorite secret story from Walt Disney World? You can let me know by calling the voicemail at 407-900-9391. That's 407-900-WDW1. Or I will post pose this question in the WW Radio Clubhouse at www.radio.com slash clubhouse. Make sure you pick up Jim's Secrets and Stories book his Peter Pan book, or anyone, or really all, of his 35 other books that he has written about Disney and animation. Uh, take them from the shelves of Amazon. Put them on the shelves in your home. Jim Corcus, brother, I love you. I appreciate you. Thank you so very much for what you do and the time that we shared today. Now, next thing, next time we do this, we have to share stories over a meal at Disney. Oh, ab absolutely. Thank you, and Thank you to all the listeners who have uh, 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 stayed and listened to all of this. And may all your Disney dreams come true. It's 
it's time for our Walt Disney World Trivia Question of the Week, where I invite you to test your knowledge of Walt Disney World history or see how well you pay attention to the details in what you see, hear, remember, or even taste. If you think you know the answer, you can enter for a chance to win a Disney prize package. And this week's trivia contest is brought to you by Jody Benson. Like, yes, the Little Mermaid herself, who invites you to join her on a magical journey from a Midwestern town to the bright lights of Broadway and the recording booth where she brought one of the most beloved Disney princesses of all time to life. And her debut memoir, Part of My World, is available now for pre-order and is a captivating behind-the-scenes look at bringing the Little Mermaid to life from the Disney legend Jody Benson herself. It is a great read for Disney fans of all ages as Jody shares stories about the difficulties in sort of nailing part of your world in the recording booth and how a distracted boy at a test screening almost led Disney executives to cut the number out of the film altogether. You'll go alongside Jody as she struggles to find her footing in the rehearsal halls of Manhattan and then finds, and then loses, and then marries her Prince Charming. She makes a splash on Broadway and gives the voice to that feisty, red-headed mermaid and a blonde bombshell named Barbie and a Tony-nominated powerhouse named Polly, how she becomes a Disney legend and searches for her own personal happily ever after. It is a must-read for Disney fans of all ages. You can get Part of My World today by going to partofmyworldbook.com. And now, before we get to this week's question, we're going to go back, review last week's, and select our winner. So last week, I admit, I got a little geeky talking about Leonardo da Vinci, if one can actually get geeky talking about Leonardo da Vinci. But anyway, I said that he was also a bit of a Disney celebrity because he appeared in not one, but two Walt Disney World attractions. Your question last week was to simply tell me what attractions were they? Congratulations if you got this one correct and knew that the answer was the extinct Epcot attraction World of Motion and the now extinct attraction in Tomorrowland, Timekeeper. And remember, Timekeeper took us and Nainai, his assistant, back to the Renaissance to meet a true visionary and one of Timekeeper's personal heroes, Leonardo da Vinci. It's actually a short yet really funny scene where Timekeeper, who's voiced by Robin Williams, has to stop Nine-Eye from sort of getting in Da Vinci's way. And at one point, Leonardo comes over to inspect Nine-Eye and says, gravity works. And so I took all the correct entries, randomly selected one. And remember, last week you were playing for a very special prize, a Displate metal poster of your choice. These are high quality prints on metal with millions of designs from Marvel and Star Wars and Netflix. I have some. I love them in my office. They are cool and beautiful and easy to hang. If you go to www.radio.com slash displate, D-I-S-P-L-A-T-E, you can check out their entire collection, including ones that I have added to some of my favorites. And if you use code WDWRadio at checkout, you can save up to 29% off your order. And if you're coming to D23 Expo, come by the WW Radio and Mouse Fan Travel booth for a chance to win displates throughout the entire weekend. I will have some on hand, ready to give away if you're in the booth and if you're watching live at D23 Expo Live. And last week's winner, randomly selected, is Pamela Bart. So, Pamela, congratulations. You can choose any design from the entire Displate library. Just go to www.radio.com slash Displate. Make your choice. Email me, and Displate will make and ship it out to you right away. If you played last week and didn't win, that's okay because here's your next chance to enter in this week's Walt Disney World Trivia Challenge. So as we prepare, and by prepare, I mean I'm scrambling like a lunatic trying to get everything ready and shipped and prepared for Disney's D23 Expo coming up in just a couple of days. We are anxiously awaiting some updates and changes and new announcements of things that may be coming to the Disney theme parks. And I think there's this ongoing trend of interactivity and personalization and gamification of the theme park experience. That got me thinking about the Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom game that lasted a number of years here at Walt Disney World. So your question this week is to tell me what character hosted the Sorcerers of the Magic Kingdom game? You have until Sunday, September 11th at 11.59 p.m. Eastern to go to www.radio.com, click on this week's podcast, use the form there, And this week, you're going to play for a mystery prize. When I say mystery, it might not just be something from the WW Radio prize closet, including a mug and a keychain and a book. It could be something from the Disney Wish. It could be something from Dizplate. 
Maybe it's something I'm going to bring home from D23 Expo. That's why it's called a mystery. So good luck and have fun. That's going to do it for this week's show. Thank you so much for taking the time to tune in this and every week. I would love to know your favorite secret story from Walt Disney World. Come be part of the community conversation over in the WW Radio Clubhouse. I'll also post this question on social. Connect with me on social. I am at Lou Mangiello on Instagram, Twitter, Facebook, and LinkedIn. And please be sure to like the WW Radio page on Facebook and turn on notifications so you don't miss a thing, especially this week, because we are going to be live on the floor and from D23 Expo this Friday through Sunday, September 9th through 11th. We'll be live throughout the entire weekend, both from the show floor in the WW Radio and Mouse Fan Travel Booth. I'll also take you on a tour of the show floor. We have interviews set up, recaps, giveaways, including Diz plate giveaways every single day in the booth. And if you're watching at home or at work live, stay tuned in the clubhouse and on social for notifications, especially as we start to line up the schedule a little bit more with specific guests and a few surprises we have planned as well. And whether you come by the booth in person or you are watching live, please do me a favor, help spread the word about the live broadcast. And to help make it easy, you can direct people to d23expolive.com. This show, D23 Expo, none of this happens without you and your support and your help and your love and your friendship. And a big part of that is because of and thanks to all of the members of the WW Radio Nation family. And as part of the nation, you help bring Like I said, everything that we do to life, they are all thanks to and by, for, and about, and with you. And you can find out how you can help the show for as little as a dollar per month, but you also get cool exclusive rewards every month like scavenger hunts, trivia quests, group video calls. We have a private Facebook group, shirts, stickers, monthly care packages, private watch parties, early access and discounts to special events, and much more. I want to thank some new and longtime members, including Susan Verkamp, Timothy Devereaux, Kyle Bollmeyer, and Tater Robinson. And if you are a Nation member and you're going to be at D23 Expo, come by the WW Radio booth because I have something special exclusively just for you. So to find out more and join the Nation, please visit www.radio.com slash support. Quick reminder about my Momentum Weekend Workshop in Walt Disney World, October 22nd and 23rd. If you want to turn what you love into what you do, there are now only seven seats left for our two-day, one-room, 50-person workshop that I really believe is going to be the best momentum to date thanks to an incredible lineup of speakers and presentations. I just revealed this past week the lineup of sessions and presenters. I shared that video in the clubhouse as well as on my personal Facebook at facebook.com slash Lumangelo. Just to give you a little idea of who's going to be there, I am incredibly excited to welcome back Duncan Wardle, the former Vice President of Innovation and Creativity for the Walt Disney Company, who's going to give us an extended interactive workshop that I personally cannot wait for. We're going to learn about leveling up your business, the hero's journey, self-care, overcoming imposter syndrome, branding, content planning, messaging, productivity, storytelling, mobile media, growth and monetization, scaling, table talks, networking, AMAs, working on what's next, fireside chat, and much, much more. As I said, we still have just a few seats left, but I still want to help you get to momentum however I can. And that's why I want to offer you a $100 off discount code just to thank you for being a friend and listening to the show. When you check out, you can use code podcast 100, one word that will save you $100 off your workshop ticket. There's, I think, one seat left for our optional Monday Mastermind. It'll also save you an additional $100 off that ticket if you want to come. And if you have any questions, please feel free to reach out to me in the clubhouse or by emailing me, lou at www.radio.com. Thanks, as always, to Mouse Fan Travel, who's not just my official and recommended travel partner for more than 15 years because it's who I use, it's who I love, it's who I trust, and who I recommend. But they really are more than just someone to help you book your next 
Disney or cruise or Aulani or any vacation or cruise to anywhere, I have partnered with Becky and the entire Mouse Fan Travel team for so long because it's about people. It's about the way that they treat their clients like they are booking their own family's vacation. An incredible level of personal service of above and beyond just trying to find the best possible prices for you. It's like they're booking vacations for their family as well. You can find out more and get a free no obligation quote by visiting mousefantravel.com. And as always, my friend, and you, you, you are my friend. And I mean that sincerely, whether we have met yet or not, hopefully I'll have the chance to see and meet or thank you and handshake and a hug and everything in between at D23 Expo this week. But all I ask is if you like the show, please help spread the word. The best ways to do that is just by recommending the show or sharing a link to this or your favorite episode on social or literally just telling a friend about the show and inviting them to be part not just of listening to it but being part of the community that you have helped create and if you can take just a couple of seconds to rate and review the show whether you're listening in spotify or if you can leave a review over at apple podcast i want to thank pat from new jersey who says enthusiastic and positive ww radio is wonderful i love the positivity and genuine love for disney especially walt disney world the parks cruise line and everything lou and his guests have it's chock full of useful and practical information about planning but also entertaining and with in-depth history on all things disney as well as offering periods of escape from the real world by letting us imagine with lou and the guests with all the stress and the busyness that we have in our lives listening to the podcast really is choosing the good pat thank you so very much and i love that you mentioned choosing the good because that's what it's all about just pausing for a second to look for and find the good and not just everything that we do, but in the people that we encounter every day as well. There's so much negativity and animosity and knee-jerk reactions and frustrations and anger, and I get it, but I think sometimes we forget to pause for just a second and look for the good in where we are and what we're doing and who we are with. And sometimes taking a moment to just look for that and treat not just our situations, but other people with positivity and kindness and respect and courtesy and politeness makes a huge, huge difference. Be the positive change that you want to see. Choose the good and be the good. And I promise it will not just make other people feel better, but you as well. I hope to see you this week at D23 Expo. And if I do, I hope it's okay that I hug you because... I'm a hugger. If I'm not going to see you on the show floor, I hope to see you in the box watching live and being part of the conversation there. Got a lot of cool, fun stuff and surprises lined up. And I really do hope that this is your best week ever. So until next time, I love you. I appreciate you. See ya. Hey, Lou Mangiello. This is Patrice Roberti calling from a beautiful day here in the metro Boston area, September 1st. And I just got a, in my email, and I got the email you sent out, the email newsletter. And I had to pick up the phone and call you. I almost called you last night. I watched the um, Facebook Live for the first time. I caught the last 20-ish minutes, and it was lovely. It was great. And what I was going to say last night, and I thought I would say today, your genuineness really shines through. And if you are 188th as genuine and appreciative as you seem to be, you're an extraordinary and, I mean, I even say an inspirational human being, your, your positive attitude uh, is a great gift that you give to your listeners. I've taken heart in it over these past couple of weeks, and we've had some family stuff going on. So, um, uh, but I, I like the I like the podcast anyway. But it's just a positive attitude. It's good to remember, and uh, and you sure have it. You sure, sure shine through. And um, God bless you. I'm glad you got the life that you hope for. And I hope you have a great time in California next week. So, thank you again. Thank you for the podcast, and thank you for uh, your enthusiasm and, and and shine through decency. Bye-bye.